Well, here's some basics about tsunamis. Tsunamis are about as different from what appears in your head, the picture that comes in your head when you hear the word wave, as you could possibly imagine. I mean, they're just a completely different beast than what we're used to thinking about with wind-driven waves that we experience when we go to the beach, for example. Important points would be that the period of these waves, which is the time between the passage of one crest and the passage of the next crest, that time for wind-driven waves is something like, even for big ocean waves, is something like 10 seconds, maybe 15, maybe 20 seconds or so. For a tsunami, this is tens of minutes. It can be an hour. What that means then is that when the tsunami comes on shore, it doesn't just sort of lap up on the shore for a few seconds and then stop and then go back. The tsunami can pour on shore for minute after minute after minute. It can pour on shore for like 10 to 15 minutes. That means the volume of water that gets delivered to the coastline is huge, and it's moving at about 30 miles per hour. People always underestimate the power of moving water. And that's what ripped up most of the buildings that we see trashed in this area of northeastern Honshu. Very, very long wavelengths. So wind-driven waves, they would have wavelengths of a few hundred meters. These have wavelengths of hundreds of kilometers. So they are gargantuan waves. What's important about that is it actually moves the seawater all the way to the floor of the ocean. Therefore, the wave is affected by the topography, by the shape of the ocean floor. In the deep ocean, tsunami moves very, very quickly. It moves basically with small amplitude, may only be 20, 30 centimeters high out in the open ocean, but it's moving at the speed of a jet airplane. When it approaches the shore, it does what all waves do, coming into shallower water. The wavelength shortens up and the wave height increases, so it amplifies. That effect is huge for large tsunamis, so the amplification effect is tremendous. So you can have a tsunami which is in the open ocean, which is maybe 10 to 20 centimeters or so high, and it can get to be meters high when it comes on shore. Well, we say that the speed slows down, and it does, but recognize that even coming on shore, the tsunami is still going like about 30 miles an hour, meaning if you're not already out of the way, it's too late. You can't outrun it. Another thing which is really important, which is really hard for people to, to understand, is that the tsunami is not one wave. It's a series of waves. This means, then, that the shoreline can experience repeated inundations by, um, by waves for many, many hours after the first wave arrives. And often the first wave is not the largest wave. So it might be the third wave, might be the fifth wave, might be three hours, might be six hours after the initial wave up arrives that the biggest wave will arrive. That kills people because people think, oh, the time of it has come and gone. It wasn't very much. They think all is safe. They walk down to low elevation areas and they get clobbered by the largest wave. passage of these tsunamis in the open ocean. So, northeast Honshu, epicenter here, Japan Trench is here. This buoy out here was the closest one to the epicenter. These buoys are actually quite amazing. Here's what they look like, a schematic of what they are. So we've got a buoy on the surface, which is just its communication links. It's tethered to the bottom. The business end, the actual measurement, is a pressure meter which is on the ocean floor, which is capable of measuring the passage of a tsunami, which might only be a few centimeters high. And what we're seeing here is tides for a few days leading up to March 11. Then the earthquake happens, and we see about from peak to trough, we see about a meter high tsunami pass over this particular buoy. Well, mind you, this buoy is in deep water. And so a tsunami, which is uh, a meter high, and it's passing in deep water, that's a very large tsunami. That's heading out towards the, towards the Pacific Ocean. It's beamed off towards distant shorelines. Within minutes, NOAA produced this map, which is the travel time for the tsunamis. 
The travel time is a function of the depth of the ocean. We know the depth of the ocean really, really well. We know these travel times very, very well. So quickly, we can determine how long it's going to take for that tsunami to get, for example, to the Hawaiian Islands. It'd be a little over seven hours. So this is like no mystery. We've known this actually for decades. And there were um, evacuations of low-lying areas in the Hawaiian Islands and eventually um, evacuations of some areas on the west coast. What is harder to do than determine the travel times is to determine how big is this tsunami going to be? I mean, how is it going to lose its energy as it goes across the open ocean? So this is a model that was produced by NOAA in real time when this event happened. The scale is here. So this is in centimeters. So the purple colors in here, this would be the, where the wave was about a meter high in the open ocean. The red zones in here, this would be when it's about a half a meter high. Again, that's in the open ocean. That's going to get greatly amplified when this thing comes on shore. So a tsunami, which is a half a meter high in the open ocean, is potentially very dangerous when it, makes, uh, when it comes on shore. Well, you can see something about the interaction of the wave with the topography of the ocean floor in here you can see how it kind of gets guided around that the energy is not uniformly distributed out here. They're like areas that get more energy than other areas. And there's a very curious thing right here where there's tsunami energy that is beamed right towards Southern Oregon and Northern California. That actually is the effect of a big feature on the ocean floor, the Mendocino Fracture Zone. So this is an old scar on the ocean floor. It's an old plate tectonic boundary, across which there's an offset in the depth of the ocean. That topographic feature basically captured tsunami energy and steered it in to the coast of California. It's one of the reasons why a place like Crescent City gets clobbered by tsunamis over and over again. Energy gets selectively beamed at um, Crescent City in part because of the Mendocino Fracture Zone. Well, this is the map that caused the um, Pacific Tsunami Warning Center to issue uh, a tsunami warning for the entire um, Pacific Basin. Tsunami evacuations did take place in coastal areas in Hawaii, in, in um, communities uh, on the Oregon coast. There was quite a bit of damage done in Brookings. There was a fair amount of damage that was done in Crescent City. There was some damage done in Depot Bay. Interestingly, the damage that happened at Depot Bay happened at 1.30 in the afternoon when the first wave arrived at 7.15. So six hours after the first arrival was when a big surge showed up and tossed boats and around in the harbor in Depot Bay and did a lot of damage. So this animation here, also made by NOAA, is going to show the wave taking off from the earthquake and you've got plots down here for four of the nearby um, uh, tsunami buoys. And they'll sort of light up, and you'll see the wave pass over them. So there goes, there goes the wave. Series of waves, right? Not one wave. Notice it's, in, it's interacting with the topography of the ocean floor. It's actually interacting with the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain in here. It's interacting with these areas down here, Papua New Guinea and so forth. It's getting steered around. It's also getting bounced. So some of the wave energy comes down here, bounces off, and is heading back. So it's a very, you get a very complicated wave phenomenon that results from this. You get oscillations that can go on for many, many, many hours after the first wave passes. These large tsunami have power all the way across the Pacific Ocean. I mean, that's the largest physi physiographic feature on planet Earth. And areas of southern Chile were evacuated successfully. Well, look at what's going on here. You're still getting all kinds of reverberations, reflections, refractions, and so forth of energy. So the ocean is complicated, right? When you stir it up with one of these big tsunamis, series of waves, lots of bounces, and so forth going on. Northeast Honshu. So you've probably seen lots of, maybe more than you wanted to see, pictures of damage of, of the tsunami here large ships, you know, carried inland. 
Sendai, we saw a lot of pictures from Sendai. This is the area where you saw the tsunami wave, you know, going across the agricultural fields and so forth, um, <laughs> photographed from helicopters. And areas then that probably have been dropped down, you know, into the intertidal zone. So the damage from the tsunami actually trailed off, trailed off, trailed off going down here towards Tokyo. Uh, 